Okay. Hello. Okay. Hello. So, um, just to in introduce our uh, first guest, everyone. Well, thank you for joining us. Firstly, and uh, this is a, a webinar we're putting on, kind of for a couple of reasons. One, because we realise that um, people have a lot of questions about the the situation that's happening, and we've got questions about um, about the the situation, about the festival, about um, about well, what's going on in the world right now, I guess. There's a lot of different opinions. So we wanted to put together something where we could answer a lot of those questions. And and we just thought it would be fun as well, hopefully, and informative. And so, uh, something to get people together. I know a lot of people maybe aren't, are maybe in the house, can't go out at the moment. So all those different things. Let me introduce our first guest. Um, just one moment. I've got something written up. Okay. So this is... Uh, Dr. Areli Cuevas Ocampo, also known as Raw Vegan Doctor. You can follow her on, on Instagram if you don't already, and YouTube. Uh, she's a consultant neuropathologist in Bristol, a senior lecturer as well at the University of Brist uh, Bristol, uh, board certified by the American Board of Pathology, um, and has also completed plant-based nutrition uh, certificates as well. And currently, our, our research and interest focuses on studying epigenetic, ep epidemiological risk factors, brain tumors, neurodegenerative disease like Alzheimer's and things like that. Um, so very highly qualified person, but also someone that's very interested in the, the raw vegan diet and lifestyle. He's been at the UK Fruit Festival and will be there this year as well. So, uh, Dr. Aurelia, is there anything else you want to add on to that in terms of an introduction for yourself? Yes, sure. Well, thank you so much for the invitation. It's an honor, honor being here with all the audience and the UK Fruit Festival um, followers, etc. Um, yeah, I mean, I am a medical doctor, as you mentioned, and I've been raw vegan since January 1st, 2018. And um, as a raw vegan myself, I can definitely see the importance of eating the right diet for our human species to develop a strong immune system not only towards against this pandemic, but also for an overall health. So, I mean, I've been preaching, you know, like a rubbing and lifestyle, and I've been calling the attention to the medical community, like, hey, yeah, plant-based diet is great, whole food plant-based diet is great, but why don't we analyze what these raw vegans are doing? Um, so it seems like they're healthy, you know? So it's, um, it's, a, it's a hard battle to fight because, People want evidence regarding this virus, uh, raw vegan diet being protective, I think is a very accurate st statement. However, um, many people disregard this advice. And uh, I mean, there's a lot of misinformation out there. So, I mean, little by little, you know, people are going to start waking up and realize how important it is to keep our bodies clean. Um, as I mentioned, not only for this pandemic, but for everything else. Um, in terms of my experience with the coronavirus, I work in the pathology department. And um, to the moment, I mean, I work in, in Bristol and we have the high, the biggest hospital in the Southwest region of, of the UK. So it's an 800 bed hospital. And so far up to now we have uh, less than 10 cases you know, like patients actually um, in, in, mm -hmm. in the intensive, intensive care unit, et cetera, with many, many other positive uh, people being tested. But other than that, you know, like there is no, uh, an emergency situation here in the hospital where I work. It's not like London or big sure. cities like New York. Well, let, let me pause you for a second, Aurelia, because I, I just wanna make sure everyone's getting the sound on. So some people are saying they're not getting sound. If anyone isn't getting sound, please let me know. Well, firstly, if people are getting sound and can hear or really just let me know. If you go to the left-hand side of your screen, the bottom left corner, there should be some settings for sound. Down at the bottom, you'll see um, you'll see uh, a kind of little. Uh, uh, you should see a setting there for your speakers and things like that. Go in and play around with that. If you're not hearing anything, a lot of people are hearing it. You can try and open it up again if you're not hearing it, but you should have different um, functions there, or, or maybe Google it. I'm not sure if we're able to go through everything, 
But okay, so if anyone's not hearing it, um, have a look at the functions here. Uh, maybe go on Google and try and find out if there's a solution to it. And if not, maybe try and open it up again with the same link. And just to say as well, if anyone wants to invite any friends to this, if you think anyone else might be interested, I've just posted the link in the chat box. If you want to send it to anyone that might be interested, then feel free to do that. It's, it's open to everyone. It's not an exclusive thing, so feel free. Okay, good. Sorry for those who can't hear. We will be, we will, uh, we are recording it, so we will be able to get out later as well. Okay, we'll, we'll keep going. Apologies if you can't hear it, but please keep on trying. Okay, thank you, Areli. Um, so let me get into some questions first, or do you just want to keep going from what you were saying? That's that's fine. I think that, that was no. I mean, I think your questions are great. So I read them beforehand, so I think they're important to address. Let me just say this: many of these questions were actually donated by Chris Kendall, who just okay. happened to send me these questions, and I thought they were quite good. So the uh, but I think that. My first question for you, uh, from your position, what's been your reaction to this whole situation? Um, there's a lot to go into about that, but from your perspective, what's your, your, been your reaction so far? You know, I've, been, I've done two live videos on my YouTube channel addressing the whole thing. My personal, very personal impression of this is that there is an exaggeration of the panic that people are being exposed to by the um, social media and mainstream media. I don't want to minimize the fact that this is a pandemic. I'm not saying that we should be irresponsible and not follow the recommendations that the government uh, and health authorities worldwide are telling to people to do, you know, like the common things that all of us should be doing, wash your hands, social distancing, um, isolation if you have symptoms that's fine i mean the governments are doing this in order to delay the spread of the pandemic but at the same time i think the direction of the news and all the different influencers online is um i think is an exaggeration in terms of like oh my god it's a pandemic like people who take this like this is gonna be the end of the world this is a conspiracy theory like mandatory vaccines, you know, like all these rumors uh, affect our psyche. So in my personal opinion, yes, it's a pandemic. It's a disease that is new. That's why there's this red alert, basically, but not necessarily something that is going to wipe out the human race. I, I don't think so. I mean, that's... <laughs> Yeah, so I guess uh, we'll get into the kind of conspiracy side of things, but um, how do you kind of feel that this will pan out? Do you think this is something that's still going to, is it, is it going to build more? Is it something that might go away quite quickly? Have you got any thoughts on that? So it appeared originally in Wuhan in China, and it's called COVID-19 because it happened or it was discovered in the winter of 2019. So it started there, they had their peak, and now they're seeing a reduced number of cases or a, a decrease in the, in the curve. Any epidemiological curve, when there is a pandemic, there is like a climbing up the peak of cases, incidents, right? And then mm -hmm. there is a peak where it's the worst, and then you have... Uh, you know, a, 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 a descent. And um, I think in the UK, we are still climbing the peak. We, we are not sure. still at the, at the peak of the mountain in terms of number of cases. That's why, you know, there is all these recommendations. And for different countries and for different cities, it's going to be different. I think New York is already at the peak. And that's why there's a lot of panic over there. Uh, I think the rules for the UK are going to be more stringent in the following two weeks just because we haven't reached the peak but it's expected that's the same thing that happened in China it's going to be replicated in all the cities and countries that are being affected by this pandemic and I just watched because I've been informing myself before coming to this webinar what's the most updated information and it seems like there is a belt Climate has a lot to do with how the virus spreads and why certain cities are being more affected than others. So right. it seems like cities and countries that are in this coronavirus belt, climate belt, 
uh, are the ones that should pay attention. So we are definitely in the belt in the UK, same as New York, same as Washington DC, like it seems like it's mm -hmm. cold weather, right? Right, right. Have you seen anything like this before? Do you think it matches any of the pa other pandemics? Because it feels like a lot, there's a lot of things that have happened in the past that never really, um, maybe they were contained better or they didn't spread so quickly. But it, does, it, does this, do you think this, um, is any equivalent thing that's happened in the past that you can remember? No, because this is a pandemic. Um, whatever happened is is the coronavirus. Maybe we can talk about the viral features afterwards. But the coronavirus belongs to the same family. COVID nineteen belongs to the same family of coronaviruses that also includes the viruses called uh, that cause SARS. Uh, in, in China back in, mm -hmm. I don't know how many years back, and the MERS in the Middle Eastern uh, respiratory uh, disease that happened in, in, in some um, Arabic countries. Uh, I think it was in 2012, if, as far as I remember. So it's the same family of virus, but those were epidemic, meaning, you know, constrained to a certain geographic region. This is pandemic, and it seems like Whoever was in China and got the disease back in the winter of 2019, if they travel or some tourists, you know, they, they brought the disease with them yeah. to different cities and, and airports and, and countries. That's why it's so kind of apocalyptic because it's happening all or, around the world. And also, I want to emphasize that this is affecting first world countries. In the past, all these epidemics, it's like, oh, mm. you know, that just happens in Africa or that sure. just happens in China. Now it's hitting the US, the UK, Italy, Spain, mm. France, Germany, you know, countries with no, no history of something like this before. Sure. Well, can we go back to some basics? We'll get back into some of these more questions, but let's get back to like some of the basic things. What exactly is a virus? What's a coronavirus? Uh, how does it spread and so on? What, what, what does it actually do to people? Yeah, a virus, so coronavirus is um, an RNA virus. There are two types of viruses, the ones that contain DNA and the ones that contain RNA. And a coronavirus has its name because by electron microscopy, meaning that very specialized ultrastructural microscope uh, detects nanoparticles, mm -hmm. a, viral, a, a virus is a nanoparticle, meaning the size is not even micron, it's, it's nanometers. So mm -hmm. a virus yeah. is a sequence of amino acids that has instructions to replicate itself and to produce a capsule to protect the genetic material. So the genet genetic material is so weak. The virus is the genetic code is basically in the, in, in, in the RNA, but also needs protection. So that's a virus. It's something that doesn't have life by itself. Right. It's a chain of genetic material protected by proteins or other um, molecules. Mm -hmm. And then once infects living organisms, utilizes the genetic machinery to reproduce itself. And once, you know, there are so many particles floating inside a cell, those particles make that cell explode because the cell cannot contain any longer all those viral particles. And one single viral particle can replicate inside the cell into, you know, hundreds, thousands, I don't know how many, yeah. and then infect neighboring cells. And then that can basically be uh, expelled when you cough in, in, in saliva droplets, all these things. So a virus is, is not even a microorganism. It's, it's like a, you know, it's the, the, the most basic example is like a computer virus. It's a piece of software. The software in this case is the genetic code and the genetic code hacks the DNA of our cells to replicate itself. That's a virus. So many people don't believe in the virus theory. Many people believe that uh, AIDS is, no, is not existent, but I just want to remind you, you know, rabies, is a virus and rabies is real. The flu is a virus. Um, there are so many other diseases. Ebola is a virus. So, you know, denying the existence of these particles and their infected capacity is, um, people need to get more educated, you know. 
Right, right, yeah, yeah. So there, there, there has been a bit of that. Um, so, <clears throat> so basically, it's, some, it's, it's something that kind of replicates itself, uh, and, and it's not. It's like DNA, but it's actually RNA. Okay. Um, how, how have these come about? I mean, it, it seems like there's a connection here with with uh, meat markets in China or something like that. And it seems like a lot of these different viruses have come from um, from farms and from meat and wild animals and things like that. So wh where's where do these come from, really? Yeah. So there, you know, different diseases have different hosts and different reservoirs and different affected hosts in that case. So, for example, uh, I always say, like, if you have a pet, a cat or a dog, it seems like some diseases affect only this type of animals, but humans can touch them and nothing happens to them. So those particular viral illnesses happen only to be um, carried by, by dogs and maybe as humans we can transmit them but we don't get infected. So for the coronavirus what happens is that um, it is speculated that bats are hosts but not necessarily get the disease. They're just reservoirs, they're just um, mm. uh, carriers of the virus, they have it in their system and according to some research they say that coronavirus COVID-19 was only found in bats and then people started eating bats in China and that's how the virus mutated. And, and they say that it originated in a wild uh, animal market in China because the conditions of these animals, I mean, once you break nature's rules, I think you give, re you give room for every other single anomaly to happen. So I don't know exactly how the virus mutated in order to jump into a human. If it's in a bat, just like a, like, you know, like all the bacteria that I have in my arms right now, because all of us yeah. are covered by bacteria. If it's in the, in the, in the, in the mucosa, in the secretions of, of bats, um, there should be some alteration in the nature of how bats live, like in these wild animal markets that make maybe the virus develop different, different uh, proteins outside, different receptors that now can match the receptors of our epithelial cells to infect right. them. That's the whole thing, you know, like the capsid of the virus, the, the, the capsule that protects the virus, the genetic material, now has these spikes that attach, you know, it's like, a, yep. I, like if you, somebody who is familiar with immunology, you have a receptor for the antigen and another kind of clip for the antibody. And if it matches, now you have room for the virus to enter into the cell. So that mutation happened, I think, because we, we violate certain rules in nature all the time. Right, right. So, uh, so uh, from, from bats is the idea. Um, yes, so people from were, bats. Were, so is, is it is it the idea that it would just be you could catch it from just the bats themselves just from touching them or is it directly from eating them any particular idea on that I'm not sure in that regard um, sure it seems it seems like uh, it happened in this wild animal market so whether it was because the bats were sick or in terrible conditions or because people started started eating those sick bats. Or, I don't know, but the bats are actually not sick. So it's just the, the conditions that, it's speculated that the conditions of the bats make the virus get some mutation and then it jump into the animal. Not sure if yeah. it was contact or eating them. Sure. I'm sure eating them because, you know, I think you don't, you don't get a bat and start kissing it just to get the virus. I think right, right, it right. um, has to come into this area and that, it makes oh, more see. sense by eating them. Right, right, yeah. right, right. Makes sense. Um, yeah. So, how? Like, let's go back to some basics on viruses again. So, how does the body react to viruses? Mm -hmm. What is what? What effect does? Well, what effect does the virus have on the body, and how does the body react to it? Yeah. So there are different thousands, millions of viral particles mm -hmm. right here, but we are born with. Mm -hmm 
immunity towards so many pathogens. When I say pathogens, I'm referring to bacteria, viruses, parasites. And along our lives, we develop all this immunity because either we develop those antibodies when we are in utero in our mom, or the mom passes that immunity uh, through the milk. And then mm -hmm. as we get exposed to the environment and different foods, mm -hmm. our body get, gets exposed to all different pathogens, but our immune system it's able to recognize them and develop defense against it. We call it antibodies. We call it, there's different type of immunity, but for viruses, basically antibodies or um, cytotoxic cells. You know, I'm not gonna get very into detail of all the different branches of immunity, but that's what happens. So in order for a virus to become infective, uh, it has to do a particular receptor. It has to have a particular receptor that is programmed to, to, to invade a human cell. So we have, for example, HIV that is exclusively affecting the macrophages and the CD4 T lymphocytes. So it's very particular. Only those cells are, are attacked by the uh, HIV virus. Um, and that's why HIV patients are so immunodepressed because the immune cells are being attacked. So the patient doesn't have any other type of defense to fight against common bacteria, common parasites. The HIV patients end up dying, not because of the HIV virus itself, but because the defense cells are, are no longer there and any other like unremarkable microorganism mm. infects and colonize the patient. So for coronavirus, um, it has receptors specific for the respiratory epithelium and our respiratory epithelium lines all the mucosas starting in the mouth, in the nose, in the larynx, uh, the bronchi, the, mm -hmm. the main bronchus, bronchi, bronchioles, and then the alveoli. So that's why it causes basically a respiratory illness. They say that uh, also some cells of the gastrointestinal tract are infected by the virus, but it's mostly respiratory. I don't know if I answered your right. question. Um, no, no, that, that, that's, yeah, and, and how, so you, uh, you kind of uh, answered that. Um, so let's get on to the concept of, of well, I, I kind of want to mention that because there's something I want to talk to you about is, for example, you brought up AIDS, and there was, the, there are some videos of people that, for example, uh, there's a video on YouTube, but you might not have seen this, but it's a guy called T.C. Fry, who was uh, a major proponent of natural hygiene and the raw food diet uh, years ago. Mm -hmm. And he has a video called, I think it's called either HIV or AIDS is a hoax. And I think there has been kind of a tradition of that a little bit, like mm -hmm. these viruses aren't the problem, it's, it's you know, uh, when it came to AIDS, it was the way it was people's lifestyle. It was drugs. It was intravenous drugs and things like that, um, and that that was more of the problem. What's your reaction to things like that, or people that maybe share ideas? And uh, you know, I, I I don't have any real qualification or knowledge in this, so I'm not saying either way. But what's your opinion on that kind of stuff? So. I think it's a very attractive idea to disregard these parasites because viruses have a parasitic lifestyle. And to say that um, it's not real, it's an oak, it's very attractive, you know, because that way it confirms our, our biases towards, oh, everything is, is a conspiracy, etc. Regardless of where the source of this virus is, some people say it's lab made, some people is, and, and there is some literature about that, like, Harvard professor, you know, was caught with uh, some Chinese students, whatever, regardless, it's a real thing. And whenever I see some, someone calling this a hoax, um, you know, I just think that they have, they have their right to believe whatever they want to believe. However, it's irresponsible to disseminate this information to misinform the other more gullible people. Um, I think everyone who sees this type of videos have to question everyone, even including myself, you know, I'm not saying, oh my God, uh, Arely's audio sometimes goes cracky. Hmm. I mean, I'm very close, so I don't know. <laughs> Are you listening to me well? Yes, yeah, sounds fine. Yeah, sounds good yeah. to me. Okay. Yeah, so um, 
I will be more skeptical. Whenever I see something that goes against common sense, just be a skeptical and investigate more. And we have the the capacity to to find out who has the truth and who doesn't. So just read more. Not everything is a conspiracy. Not everything is um, you know against us. That that will be my type of yeah. reaction. Just investigate more, read more, and, sure. and use common sense as well. So let me ask, with, with this particular uh, pandemic or this particular virus, um, is this one, is this worse, is this more dangerous than some of the other, um, you know, viruses that are out there? There's, there's a lot of numbers in terms of statistics of how many people are dying from it that are getting it, and it's very, quite high numbers, even if it's only 1%, that's still a very high number of people uh, died from, but, but sometimes we're seeing three percent, four percent of 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 people that have been diagnosed with it have died from it. So, what do you think about those kind of numbers? Is that um, inflated at all, or is that because because obviously not everyone has been tested yet? It's impossible to test if everyone's how many people have it yeah. because of the we don't have the services to be able to do that. Um, but what's your, what's your thoughts on on that? Yeah, as so I was checking some statistics this morning, and it seems like SARS back in, I think it was 2002, I'm not sure on that, but SARS had a fatality rate, fatality rate meaning number of cases that, or number of deaths against uh, the whole population. And, um, um, you know, there are different, different statistical uh, formulas to detect that either you divide the total number of deaths versus the infected ones, or the total number of deaths versus the whole population who is not, which is not affected. So that's incidence. And then fatality is death versus infected, that division. So I think we should take these numbers with uh, caution because for example, we need to consider the population in China is billions of people. I don't even remember how many billions are in China. I think there are 1.5 or 2 billion, I don't remember, but it's billions, it's not millions. So the fatality rate in China, they say, no, Italy is not, is now more, you know, the, the virus is more deadly in Italy. Uh -huh. And now the US is more, and Spain was more in the past. So yeah, it depends, yeah. you know, we have to consider the population being affected, the specific numbers for that country versus how many cases are being detected. That's the other thing. There are so many asymptomatic patients and that will definitely decrease the fatality rate because we don't know. I mean, I think I had the virus in January uh, because I, and I didn't know what it was because obviously the symptoms and everything has not been described at the moment. But in January, I had mm -hmm. all the things that they described. I went to Mexico, I came back to the UK. I spent seven days in the summer in the, in the beach, hot weather, you know, everything nice. And then I came back to England that drastic change in temperature in the climate definitely affected me, regardless of me being a raw vegan or not. So um, what I'm saying, why I'm saying this is because I was not detected. Even if I am a case, if I already had exposure to the virus, the statistics are, are not considering people like me or other people who are already infected, but are asymptomatic. So it's, in my, in my opinion, it's a, uh, it's inflated, but everything has been inflated, not only here, but you know, for, for all the pandemics, because if we think about it, they say that one person who is infected with the virus, regardless of it's asymptomatic or not, uh, it's estimated that it's gonna be infecting three other more people. So if I already had contact with all the personnel in the lab where I work, mm -hmm. they already have developed the immunity and they're not being, in they're not being bring into account for the statistics. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. What, what do you think about the, a lot of the recommendations out there, like uh, social, like everyone staying at home, uh, social distancing, um, it, over, over here in, I'm in Asia right now, a lot of people wear masks. I, they seem to be wearing masks all the time, regardless of pandemic, but um, maybe some people in the UK are wearing masks as well. I'm not sure. Um, do you think these are quite uh, good steps to take and um, worth worthwhile uh, following these recommendations? Yeah. Is this the right stuff to do? I think it's the right thing to do for for 
everyone. Um, but I am very disappointed at the health authorities worldwide because they don't put emphasis on nutrition. And I mean, some people in some countries they are for, forbidden going outside to take fresh air. That's ridiculous. Right. And I'm so glad that in the UK they have mm -hmm. not forbidden going out for a run. I just came back from a run. And if I don't do that, you know, my immune system goes down. If I don't take fresh air, my immune system goes down. So they shouldn't be so stringent in that regard. But they have to do it because some people abuse, you know, the, the situation. Like some people go for second runs. I'm in a runner's forum and they say, how not to get caught when you get for your second run. Just, just change your running top or, you know, like, okay, wh why don't we just follow <laughs> the rules? <laughs> and yeah. these, these measurements are being taken seriously because the health, systems will collapse if we have you know all people all the sick people at once going to the emergency departments mm -hmm. i'm telling you in my hospital there are, there are 800 beds but there are already sick people in the hospital hospitalized so how yeah. the healthcare providers are gonna decide who to intubate versus is basically deciding who am i gonna allow what person i'm deciding that they should they deserve to be, you know, to live versus dying. It's, it's, it's a very difficult t situation to be. So it's just prevention because if I'm infecting three people, if I had the virus, and if all these three people infect all the three people at the same time, imagine that exponential, right, um, rate of affection. Yes. So if all of them are coming to the hospital, they're, over, they're gonna overwhelm the whole, the whole system that's that's why they're making all these restrictions and i agree with them to to a certain extent what i don't agree is that the emphasis on how can you prevent the virus not only um yeah. measurements to self-isolate and don't touch six feet apart how do you enhance your immune system so if the virus get in contact with you you are protected the, yeah. nobody pays attention to that well i just think it's funny as well that like if, if we look at it, I mean, going back to the point about this coming from bats or whatever, it came, or some people have said pangolins and stuff, but, um, you know, so many of these infectious diseases seem to have connections with animals, with farming, and still there's no conversation there about, we, need, we, we really need to stop uh, eating meat, <laughs> like let's stop eating animals because it's leading to all these problems, all these other diseases. And I just feel like if this had all come from, I said this earlier, but if this had come from cucumbers, if it was like absolutely sure that this, this uh, had, had went to human beings because some Chinese people had eaten cucumbers or whatever, like there would just be no cucumbers on any shelf in the world, like immediately. And yet we're, st we're still eating all these animals. It's, it's really strange. Anyway, uh, I don't want to go into that too much, but let's talk about the immune system you brought up the immune system what does it do how do we uh, help it what can we do to kind of uh, how should we be um what should we be recommended to other people in our lives that maybe want to uh, strengthen their immune system if that's possible yeah so again my disappointment with the whole health uh, system is that they don't they don't recommend things as simple as get enough vitamin C, not pills, not supplements, enough natural sources of vitamin C, which is abundant in a plant-based diet, particularly fruits, particularly uh, citruses, leafy greens, everything that is colorful, orange, yellow, you know, oranges, grapefruit. Uh, I think uh, grapes also have a lot of vitamin C. Leafy greens, they don't put emphasis on that. And Another important vitamin for that is vitamin A. Vitamin A is not only important for the eye to have a good sight, a good vision, but also it's important to regenerate the epithelial system, especially the respiratory epithelium. So a, rich, a, a diet rich on vitamin C, as I mentioned, vitamin A, everything that is colorful as well has vitamin A. Spinach, leafy greens, uh, carrots, uh, fruit. I mean, fruit, nobody pays attention to the fruit. That's those are those are measurements to take in terms of vitamins a c d as well we need vitamin d for strong calcium metabolism um 
and sun exposure, of course, that's crucial and vital. In terms of how to enhance naturally our immune system is obviously a, a diet that is rich in fluids. And again, a raw vegan diet gives you that because when you eat cooked food, you use water to kind of absorb the whole dead stuff that you're eating. So if we wanna, if we wanna keep our body clean in a flowy state, literally flowy state, because if you eat plant-based diet, rich in fruits and vegetables, but mostly fruit, you are keeping your body, the water in your body moving and eliminating fast and fast, whatever is strange in your body. So that's another way to do that. Another way is to do exercise, to move daily. The limb, the limb system doesn't move if you don't move, so you have to move as well. Uh, if you cannot go out, if you're in a seriously lockdown, you can do yoga, <laughs> you can do, there, I mean, there's YouTube channel that have workouts, that will be great. Mm. Um, there are no other things, obviously avoiding putting yourself at risks. Many people are saying, oh, I'm gonna fast and pray in this season. That's fine, you know, you can do that, but don't compromise your immune system. Fasting itself is a stressful situation. So I wouldn't try anything new other than enhancing and improving your diet rather than depleting yourself from certain That's nutrients. Fantastic. Yeah. So you're, you're saying that people shouldn't be trying to do anything drastic, like no extreme no. changes, fasting, no. things like no. that. Okay. Because when you fast, I mean, fasting has uh, some, fasting is used for healing, for healing purposes. And I'm against long-term fasting, but short-term fasting, of course, especially if it's supervised, like uh, the clinic that they have in Santa Rosa, California, people that are drastically ill, they can find a lot of benefits out of fasting. But we have our lessons. Remember, all these ex-raw vegans that now are eating meat again, they had long-term water fasting that is unnecessary, in my opinion. So regardless of how spiritual you want to become in this pandemic, because many people are like, let's pray and fast, let's uh, purify ourselves, let's take advantage of this coronavirus to do something new. I, you know, I go against that point of view because our bodies like consistency. Our bodies yeah. like to... Oh, right. I yeah. like it, yeah. <laughs> our bodies like to so stay you... safe and putting ourselves yeah. to a different complete to, to, to a completely different environment like fasting is like putting your body under unnecessary stress so you know a couple of days mono meal on 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 oranges fine one day water fast okay do it but seven days water fast or uh, detox protocols for two weeks in this pandemic i don't i don't recommend that Okay, great. Um, someone's also, I would ask people if anyone else wants to ask a question now, feel free to put some questions up. I've only got a few left, but what would be your thoughts on? Um, yeah. No. Oh, here, here's the thing. Some people talk about antivirals, things like oregano, sage, rosemary, garlic, ginger. Do you think any of these help? So all of those are irritants to the body, uh, especially garlic. Garlic is an antibiotic, so there is time and place for garlic. I personally don't think uh, adds more benefit in terms of a viral illness. It only, if you if you get a, a flu or a cold or something like that, if you wanna add some spices, for example, ginger tea or a sauce that is rich in ginger or things like that, that are a little bit irritant to the body, I don't see anything wrong with that. Some people in the rubbing and community eat garlic, but for the sake of fighting against the virus, it's just the reaction that your body is is using against some irritant. So, you know, cayenne pepper, all these spices, yeah, you're gonna get more runny nose because your body's trying to get rid of uh, the caspasin in the in the chili peppers, for example. So, it's debatable, but I don't think it's gonna kill the virus, right? It's just gonna enhance your body responds to eliminate faster something. But if you are eliminating viruses like crazy, you know, watch out who you are infecting or that will be my, my answer. It's not sure. gonna kill the virus for sure. Interesting, yeah, interesting. So probably one of the most controversial topics as well as uh, the one of, of vaccines. And vaccines, um, 
are a huge topic of like conspiracy information and I, I, I don't know there's a there's a lot of information out there going both ways about vaccines and a lot of people especially in the in the natural the alternative health natural health movement raw vegan movement a lot of people want to avoid vaccines never take a vaccine and all that kind of stuff and um what what would be your thoughts about a vaccine that might come up for this or a mandatory vaccination or something like that? How would you respond to that? Um, what's your thoughts on vaccines in general? Okay, so in regard to the coronavirus vaccine, it's not being developed yet. To develop a vaccine, it takes months to test it, to make it effective. Uh, so people are saying, oh, this is a, an opportunity for the powerful men or pharmaceuticals to vaccinate everyone. I don't think that's going to be the case. And I think so because most of the people, it is estimated that 80% of the people worldwide, because it's a pandemic, are going to get exposure to the virus, but not 80% of the people worldwide. Imagine that will be 6 billion people uh, are going to get symptoms or, or, or sick because of the virus. So all of these billions of people who are going to get in who are gonna get in contact with the virus are gonna develop natural immune response to that. So what is a vaccine? It's something mm -hmm. artificial that helps you to fight an infection. But at this moment, you know, with all the exposure that has happened, I don't think a vaccine is gonna be mandatory. So whoever is getting scared about it, forget it. Forget it because whether you have noticed or not, probably you already got exposed to it. Um, I think a vaccine for coronavirus um, can be, you know, implemented for people who are definitely in terrible situations, like those who are in the ICU, who are probably in a coma, and who are immobilized for a long periods of time. They cannot even move to, to fight anything. So for those cases, probably. But if people don't want to get vaccinated, I also think is the right to reject anything that they don't want in their body. But I'm not saying with this that vaccines are ineffective. There's a lot of controversy and myself, I'm not entirely sure what will be the right answer because one part of me tells me that vaccines have been effective. You know, polio has been eradicated because of vaccines, etc. But I've been reading other stuff that says, you know, polio was actually happening because of bad um, hygiene conditions. So a lot of data to analyze, a lot of things to consider. But what I can tell you is that mandatory vaccination out of this pandemic is not going to happen. And if people want to refuse a vaccine, for example, the best thing to do is to do a serological test. Go to your doctor, ask for a serological test against uh, if you have antibodies against coronavirus. And that way you can prove like, I don't need a vaccine. You know, I have the antibodies already. But some people, you know, some people are going to be more reassured if there is a vaccine because that's the way people think. In my opinion, it's better to develop a natural immune response to anything. But sometimes, you know, if I was working inside a hospital and they tell me, doctor, if you don't get vaccinated, you, you're going to be at risk of spreading the disease to elderly people. You know, just for the sake of protecting others, I will do that. But it's just my opinion for that particular situation. Okay, um, let's yeah. have a look at some other. Any, any other, anyone else got any questions? Anyone else want to, uh, if anyone wants to actually uh, uh, ask a question, uh, we can maybe even bring you on for a few minutes. We have 15 minutes left with Aureli till our next uh, guest. Let me go through some of the comments. Some research, Matthew saying some research are now looking at avoidance of ibuprofen based on the fact that it increases production of an enzyme the virus latches on to. Grant said Denmark, Denmark announced that it will make the, the COVID-19 vaccine mandatory when it's available. Um, Natalie's talked about Bill Gates. Eventually, we will have some digital certificates to show who has been recovered. Yeah, this, Bill Gates seems to be involved in a lot of this stuff. Um, Rogers asked the question, does constant fear affect the immune system? Yeah. Okay, so I, I can see the questions as well, and, and there are many, so I'm just going to try to go sure. fast. Uh, and I've seen all this, the same question, how does obes obesity affect the virus? Well, obesity affects the body, not the virus, and obesity is a condition where not only your immune system is compromised, but 
the whole cardiovascular system. So it's better, it's better to lose weight. Obesity is not a healthy way of being and slows down everything. So your immune system slows down, everything slows down with obesity. So lose weight. Uh, my opinion on the germ theory, the germ theory is valid to a certain extent in this pandemic. But again, the terrain theory is, I think is predominant in this pandemic. There are so many isolated cases, you know, that you're gonna be listening. Like recently, a 19 year old woman passed away for coronavirus, from coronavirus here in the UK. And she was healthy and a good student and strong lady. You're gonna see all this type of reports in the news because those are the outsiders. Those are the things that escape the, 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 the curve of epidemiology. And, Obviously, the news want to sell bad news because bad news sell out. So, yeah, there are going to be isolated cases where young individuals are going to have this disease. Um, but we don't know anything. What is in the background? Like some people, some very good athletes, for example, they just fall off death and they're like, what happened? And then sooner, you know, the autopsy reveals, oh, they had an intrinsic cardiac defect. But health is not measured like the way you look outside. So all these stories that are gonna come up, young patient, no, asymptomatic, nothing happened. Like the perfect individual died of coronavirus. Well, let's, let's mm -hmm. question what's underneath. Um, so that's, you know, something, um, the germ theory. The germ theory says that the pathogen, the microorganism is in charge of uh, mm -hmm. taking control of your body, making you sick. That's the germ theory. Uh, the terrain theory says that if, a healthy body is in the perfect state, no matter how pathogenic the microorganism is. If the terrain is good, nothing's going to happen. So it's very, it's very subjective because let's put myself as an example. I consider myself a healthy individual. But if someone maliciously injects me with a hepatitis virus, like they sequester me and force me, you know, like on purpose, give me a, 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 an injection of uh, hepatitis, but I'm going to get the disease. So regardless of how my terrain is, I'm going to get it. That's very, very uh, hypothetical situation. Uh, so that doesn't work. The terrain doesn't work there. Uh, tetanus, uh, tetanus um, infection. If you are not vaccinated against tetanus, and if you get a wound, and if that gets infected with Clostridium tetan tetany, you're going to get tetanus. So it's, I think tetanus is important to be vaccinated against. Um, but overall, that's, those are just small percentage of cases in terms of how the germ theory is actually true. But the vast majority of diseases, especially not the zoonotic or pandemic ones, the germ theory doesn't work. It goes more like the terrain. Let's keep the terrain clean so nothing else affects us. You know, I don't know if that makes sense. Um, yeah, a any other questions from anyone? Chloe, the 21-year-old healthy girl who died this week, went to my son's school. We know the oh, family. Wow. She had many allergies, which is not being reported. Wow, that's Oh, wow. That's, interesting. that's huge. That's uh, huge. Parks asked, what are, the risks, what are the risks for small babies and breastfeeding mothers? I don't think there is a risk because when a mother has any disease, she's developing antibodies and that's how immunity uh, works. Like a baby who is breastfeeding, they're getting directly the antibodies from, from the milk, from the mom. So it shouldn't be a risk. There is a crazy article that I read that I don't know who is recommending. I think the CDC that mothers should be separated from the babies if they're positive for coronavirus. I don't, I don't know. Right. I, I don't know what to think about it. I think it's crazy. It goes against, it goes against everything that we know about immunity. So. Uh, let's see. Uh, kind of, kind of, and following up with that kind of breastfeeding mother with coronavirus continue breastfeeding. Is that, uh, I mean, if it's a, that there or? I want to be a resp responsible, you know, with, with my answers. So um, the virus has an incubation period of two to two days to 14 days. So if a mother has flu-like symptoms, how do you know if it's coronavirus, right? 
it's better to get tested. And if the test confirms, yes, in fact, you have coronavirus, um, I don't think a few weeks of the illness is going to do anything for the baby if you decide to go um, with the separation of the baby and, and the mom. You know, getting the milk out mm -hmm. of the mom, I recommend that because, again, the, the mother is developing the antibodies. The milk is not going to have the virus unless there's a study that I haven't read about, like, oh, milk, human breast milk has coronavirus. I haven't read that. So my, my, my recommendation, again, take it with a grain of salt. I haven't read anything about it. But logically, I think that separation, yeah, maybe until, until you get tested. If you think that you get the coronavirus, better to get tested if you really worry about your baby. You know, it's, it's very subjective. For you as a doctor, like, what, what are your recommendations to people? Like, how can people like, help the health service? Or I'm guessing that, and I don't know if you're at the hospital today or you were this week, but what are we recommended to do? Should we kind of just, I don't know, should we, should we even bother trying to get tested? If you're a relatively healthy person, should you bother going to the hospital, even if you feel you've got the symptoms? Or what, what do you think? You mean for for the general people, like what they should, what they should do, going to the hospital or not? Yes. Or? Yeah, yeah, because I, I guess it, it, it's easy to kind of develop a cough or whatever and start to think the worst or whatever. So. Yeah. Uh, no, I don't think you should go to the hospital, especially because they're not going to pay attention to you. The first thing that they're going to do to you is to take the temperature. If the temperature is not fever, they're not going to admit you. They're not going to treat you. So. At the moment, uh, to help the NHS in this case, or the hospital in your particular city, is not to overwhelm them and take it as it is. I mean, people don't, 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 don't pay attention to all the celebrities and all the government uh, figures that are getting the virus. And they're fine, right? They're fine. It's a cold. Yeah. It's different, slightly different. You don't get runny nose. You don't get uh, sneezing frequently. You get fever. You get severe fatigue, uh, you get shortness of breath, you get um, cough. So if you mm. think you have those symptoms, just self-isolate, treat it as a common cold, enough uh, liquids, enough rest, um, food that is clean, a lot of herbal teas, vegetable soup if you're not a raw vegan, if you're rubbing and a lot of citruses, I will just treat it as a common cold, self-isolate if none of your family has had it. But eventually, you know, you're gonna you're gonna get in contact with them anyway. So better to get the immunity now. I mean, spring is around the corner. The the winter is passing. Yeah. So it's just it's just not following the narrative, like the panic mindset of everything around. Just look at the politics. They're getting the coronavirus and they're fine. <laughs> right, right. Um, that's, that's a good point. The, the Prime Minister has the coronavirus, apparently. Uh, so, Rogers asked, I don't know if you answered this one, but being bombarded by constant fear, is that affecting our immune system? Oh, definitely. Definitely, because we run on hormones. And, for example, the flight or fight mechanism is driven by adrenaline. If you're in a dangerous situation your first instinct is to run right or or to fight mm -hmm. and that's driven by adrenaline so you get all pump up your heart start starts racing or your blood you know is uh irrigating your muscles so you're ready to either run or fight that's adrenaline if you are under fear that's a different hormone and that's called cortisol and cortisol is released by the super um uh super renal glands by uh, the cortex of the, the gland, release of cortisol. And cortisol is a hormone that depresses the immune system. For any person who has an autoimmune disease, meaning that their own immune system is exaggerating their response, they give them steroids, they give them cortisone, and cortisone is derived from cortisol. So we don't want to deplete our immune system with fear, because fear depletes better said, fear enhances the cortisol production. So we don't want to be with cortisol circulating all over, all over mm -hmm. our body in this pandemic. 
don't deplete your immune system with the release of cortisol. All the contrary, you know, just uh, hormones that are happy hormones, serotonin, watching good news, seeing the sunlight, seeing nature, watching cat videos, anything that makes you happy, that's what you should, you should mm -hmm. be doing rather than constantly turning on the TV, watching your posts, scary posts on social media. That really doesn't help. Yeah, so uh, we've got a few minutes left. Uh, I just want to say to everyone, if you want to, I'm, I'm sure you'd maybe be open to questions as well if, if people want to go on your Instagram or YouTube channel. Uh, at Raw Vegan Doctor, you can follow Arely on Instagram. Uh, anywhere else, any, anywhere else that we can follow you or? Uh, follow yeah, up yeah. So Raw, Raw Vegan Doctor is my handle for my Instagram, my Facebook account, my YouTube channel, um, and um, my Twitter. So that's my handle. You can just Google Raw Vegan Doctor and find me anywhere. So if you'd like uh, any last comments or if you'd like to have a look at some of the questions and see if there's any that you could maybe answer fairly quickly, or there's quite a few, um, could you potentially answer, answer a few last questions or if you've just got some last words of advice or whatever, feel free to share. Yeah, so two important questions that I've been seeing here uh, in, the, in the chat, the last ones. Is this just a start? It depends where you live. I think in the UK, as I mentioned at the beginning, we are climbing the the peak we are not yet at the peak of the iceberg we are escalating that and don't be surprised again it's gonna get worse in the uk because more cases are gonna happen and it's expected it's exactly what happened in china what happened in spain what happened in italy we're gonna get that as well probably not in all the cities but once you know that and you expect that you are just prepared and don't panic i'm telling you it's gonna happen New York is getting at the peak and, and, and they're panicking. But other places like California, I've been asking a lot of people, no, we are fine here. And regardless, you know, California is considered like a super hub, like a big city as well. So again, we talk about the, the, the coronavirus belt. It seems to affect the cities that are in this in similar weather conditions. Some people question, okay, Turkey. Turkey is supposed to have the same weather as Germany and Italy and, and because it's in the belt. What happened in Turkey? It seems like Turkey has also a lot of humidity in the weather. So imagine if I cough, the viral droplets are gonna be floating, but since there's no humidity and it's a static situation, cold weather, the viral particles are gonna be floating uh, for more time in cases where you have countries like Turkey with a lot of humidity, all that water is gonna kind of uh, um, bring down those particles to the, to the ground. So just expect that, yeah, it's gonna hit and different uh, peaks and more incidences and more countries affected. Yeah, it's gonna happen, I'm telling you. Authorities are thinking that April still is gonna have all this up the hill curve but the prediction is that by May, this is gonna go down all over the world. So that's, that's my prediction and that's why I'm optimistic and, and, and confident that the UK Fruit Fest is gonna happen, Canada Fruit Fest is gonna happen, uh, Woodstock is gonna happen. So don't cancel it. I mean, I, I wish I'm not wrong, but you know, knocking on the wood, I think this is gonna be over by, <laughs> by May. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, that's that's good. That's some good positive information. Um, well, great. Uh, thank you for joining us. Excellent. Thank you for your time today. Obviously, you've probably been busy with all that's happening at the moment. No, it's a, a lot of one more, one more thing. So before, sorry, sorry to interrupt you. The last question that I see here, and, and it's important, that 5G and related to the virus. I don't think there is a relationship with 5G and the virus. Otherwise, California will have it. Mm. Otherwise, um, I don't know, big cities with bi, uh, high 5G hubs and, and stations are going to have it. So sure. no, I don't see the relationship. Sorry to interrupt you. Yeah. No, excellent. But uh, go and follow Dr. Aureli uh, at Raw Vegan Doctor online and on Instagram, YouTube, Facebook, and so on. If you've got more questions for her, you can ask questions here or you can uh, go on her Instagram and I'm sure she'll be happy to answer your questions if she has the time to. And um, yeah, and Aurelia will be at the UK Fruit Fest, God willing, and if Boris Johnson allows it and everything. So uh, we'll, we'll see you there. We look forward to learning more from you. 
we have to move on to our second guest. So thank you very much, Aureli. And um, let me just try and, yeah, thank you very much. You're welcome. Let's see what we can do here. Okay. And if you want to, if, if you want to hang about, of course you can. Uh, give me a second. What am I doing here? I'm just getting up. 